Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, an alternative to deer stalking, where after big billy goats gruff in the Galloway Forest, we meet the world record breaking catfish kid. Learn to shoot straighter with Olympic trap hopeful Abby Burton. First, more and more Britons are going back to their Robin Hood roots. If you were in the USA right now, you could even shoot yourself a Christmas dinner. <coughs> the turkeys in Roy Lupton's garden are understandably a bit nervous, but they have nothing to fear. If they were stateside, however, it would be prudent for them to lie low this side of Christmas as their popular sport for bow hunters in the USA. Hunting anything with a bow in the UK is illegal. This came into force through the Deer Act, which regulated the velocity and grain weight of a projectile used to shoot deer. It did a great job stopping irresponsible undesirables from injuring animals with crossbows, but Roy feels it was a shame we lost one of our traditions as well. When the, the law came into force, we lost um, you know, part of our heritage, I feel. so. Uh, Unfortunately now we have to, to travel further afield. It's a, an incredibly popular sport in America uh, that's got a, a very large following and also in Africa as well. So when I, when I hunt I, uh, I, I go off to Africa and that's where we practice it. Roy's been going to Africa to bow hunt for 10 years now. He tends to shoot small games such as impala and warthog. He feels that the work he has to put into getting close enough to take a safe shot makes him a better all-round hunter. It's, it's a fantastic way of hunting because when you're out there and you're in the bush it's very very different from from rifle hunting from rifle shooting or stalking because you've got to be a lot closer I mean most of the shots that we take are around about 30 40 yards um, just to make sure that you're you, you know you're accurate and that you're taking a, a clean kill and you're you're ensuring best practice for the animal so everything's a lot closer and a lot more personal so you you're if you like, you know, you're feeling the animals, you're sensing the animals, you're smelling them, you're hearing them, um, and it's, you know, really, really gets the, the senses going. So for me, I, I really I love my stalking and enjoy my, my shooting, but uh, bow hunting just takes it to a different level. Roy either stalks on foot or sets up in a hide near a waterhole. On this occasion, after many hours lying in wait, a warthog appears on the edge of the clearing. He's spooked. But he comes back for more and Roy takes his chance. With bow hunting you can get something that they call string jump and from the warthog hearing the string the warthog moves his shoulder back slightly so the arrow does hit the shoulder but still penetrates all the vital organs as well. Um, he runs off and he was, uh, he was dead about uh, 50 yards into the bush. It wouldn't be sensible for someone to just pick up a bow and head over to Africa hunting. Roy puts in an hour's training every day leading up to a trip. This is a technical bit of kit, not just a bit of wood with baling twine. This bow alone costs about £600. I mean, it looks incredibly different to the bows that uh, most of us grew up with and you know, sort of uh, ran around with in the field, which was a, a, piece of, uh, a piece of stick with a bit of string tied to either end. This one fires arrows out at around about, or just over 300 feet per second. I think it's 320 or 340 feet per second. And with bow hunting, it's vital that you practice. Um, everything that we do is practice, practice, practice. So you get muscle memory. Uh, everything that you do should become second nature. So the shot, when you're ready to take the shot, the shot goes off without you even having to think about squeezing shot, the shot off. All you should be concentrating on is making sure that you're on target and the arrow is travelling to the right point. One of the questions Roy is often asked is about animal welfare. Is an arrow going to be as effective in killing the animal as a rifle shot? As long as you take the shot and you are proficient with your shot and the, the arrow hits the target then it is just as lethal as a, a rifle bullet. The, the difference being is that with a rifle bullet it goes in and expands and then causes the shock wave through the body. What you're looking to do when you shoot an animal with, a, with an arrow is for the arrow to go in and to cut a very large wound channel 
through the, the vital organs, so you're looking to disrupt the heart and disrupt the lungs. It, it is a very, very quick and efficient way of, of harvesting animals. To illustrate the differences, we head off to a private woodland with a couple of watermelons and bales of hay. Roy warns us that there probably won't be enough melon to go around for picnic after he's finished with it. First, Roy gets his eye in. Now it's time for the melon to get into the firing line. It's a great shot. The bale stops the arrow flying straight through and out the other side. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's quite nice. I mean, it shows the, the huge damage that would be done to the, the vital organs. So there's, uh, there's no way that the animal would be going very far with a shot like that. It would be uh, instantly fatal. If you, as, but that's the thing. With, with archery or with bow hunting, you need to make sure that your, your shots are 100%. You've got no room for error. With a rifle, as we were saying before, with the, the hydraulic shock, that allows for a little bit of, of error. But the ranges that we're talking about hunting, the ranges that we're talking about shooting, for the welfare of the animal, we make, or I personally make sure that I bring those ranges down to avoid any error. So, you know, 30, 40 yards maximum. Roy now gets the rifle. Tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> This slow-mo shot gives us a wonderful illustration of what the impact of a ballistic tip bullet can do. If you've been using a, a soft nose um, bullet head, then it would have gone through and then created a, a big opening at the back, but I just wanted to see what a, a ballistic tip would do. But again, it shows the damage that can be done to the carcass as well. So with the arrow, you don't get, or you hardly get any wastage. Um, whereas with a, a rifle bullet, then if you're shooting into the shoulder region, then it can damage a lot of the shoulder meat, etc. I mean, it, again, it's not the meat that you're you're losing there is is nothing significant, but um, you know it is a, a big difference or a vast difference with the carcass. So there we have it: bow against rifle. They offer two very different styles of hunting and two very different but effective ways of taking down your quarry. But as Roy has shown, if done properly, the bow can be equally as deadly. What do you get the shooter who has everything? We ask the experts. Well, if he's a keen rifle shooter, um, there's many accessories that one could buy, but I mean, I would look at things like monopods, uh, shooting bipods, uh, anything like this on the, on the rifle side. They're pretty well covered, they're sort of 15 to 25 pound items. So uh, if it's a shotgun shooter, I would say things like the pelt or earmuffs, some of the stereo earmuffs that we offer that we bring in from America which go up to about 29.99, as little as that. Um, Are those the ones where you can't hear the bang, but you can hear the beaters? Yeah, they're, well, they're the ones that you can actually hear what the other shooters are saying about you half, half uh, the way down the line, but uh, you may not want to hear exactly what they've got to say. But uh, when the gun goes off, they automatically shut off, so, uh, you know, obviously you don't get deafened. So we've got those, you may have to spend a bit more than £20, you know, 29.99, and that would uh, perhaps keep your relationship sweet. And then, of course, you've got things like shirts and what have you, and uh, gloves, you know. So all those little stocking fillers and the shooter's essentials, you know, they're, they're going to be um, uh, what he's going to be requiring, one would hope. I would recommend the Ely Diary, the good old standby. Depending on who the shooter was, maybe a peg set, which is £19. There are a lot of small item, gift items you can pick up, which will make great stocking fillers. 20 quid presents, what have you got? 20 quid presents. Lots of things like butylo calls, uh, decoy calls, decoys themselves, uh, lamps, etc. You can buy a lamp for sixteen ninety nine from us. You know you have a huge spectrum, from bottom scale to top scale. Um, you know you can buy filters for tenner, etc. You can buy camo jacket um, for for twenty quid. A camo jacket for twenty quid. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. We have anything from twenty pounds up to you know up to one hundred and fifty pounds for camo. But again, all good quality. Majority of it's now waterproof. Those pop-up hides, they look so Christmassy. They look yeah, Christmas I mean, the pop-up hides, I mean, they're very good for the pigeon shooters, the deer stalkers as well. Um, but uh, again, your pop-up hides, you're going to be in the region of anywhere between 65 to 85 pounds. We do sell here uh, leather cartridge uh, cases, bags, also uh, shotgun 
uh, carrying cases. Uh, and also we have uh, a leather brass and full zip uh, up and over shotgun slip as well, £100. If you bought one of the bar sets, which was a nice leather case, uh, three separate bottles inside, whether you wanted gin, slow gin, whiskey, or ginger ale and Coca-Cola, whatever. It's a nice set, it's a nice gift. It will last probably forever and he can give it to his grandchildren when he's retired from the shooting world. So I, th I think the real must-have this Christmas for £20 is this hat, which is the hat to have this year. It's going to be so useful for the guy who's wear working outside. It has two strengths of light, now we're on full power. And if you're working outside, whether you're a gamekeeper, whoever you are, out in the garden even, this is going to be the hat to have. What would you like from the shop? Uh, probably a Abiatico Salvinelli shotgun. Um, they do some wonderful guns. They've got a great uh, 28 bore 410 combination over there. Uh, side plate, um, double trigger, beautiful, absolutely lovely. I'd have that. My own Christmas present, well, that would have to be a, really the new FAMARS range. I haven't got one coming for Christmas, but I do have one coming for my birthday. So, I mean, uh, I think if uh, somebody loved me enough, that's what I'd ask for. I'd ask for a nice FAMARS. Myself, if it was my choice, I'd have a pair of hammer ejectors, which are a little harder to find. And uh, the older guns that I'm interested in have already lasted a lifetime. I mean, a pair of hammer ejectors would be around the turn of the century, so they're already 109 years old. So when they go on, as long as you clean them, they'll last forever. If you need to find any Christmas presents, or indeed, if you're in the middle of Exmoor and you've run out of cartridges, why not use our map-based directory? It's free. Go to www.fieldsportschannel.tv and put in your postcode. A map will come up with a cartridge shop. Now, you may have noticed over the last few weeks that the Field Sports Channel official vehicle has been a Mitsubishi Shogun. We've taken it through the high hills of the Lake District, surfing through the wet Scottish borders and across the shifting, dangerous sands of Morecambe Bay. Now, we've put it in the hands of top motoring journalist and shooter, Dominic Holton. He's out to make it more mucky than Dirty Gertie from number 30. Move over the Stig, it's the Trig. I've been a motoring journalist for the last 10 years, um, but most of the time I test high performance vehicles, sports cars. Uh, normally if I'm dealing with Mitsubishi products, it's stuff like the Evo. But obviously as a shooter, I'm also interested in four wheel drives, I own a Land Rover, um, and I've done some work with some of the shooting magazines testing 4x4s and shooters vehicles to see how they shape up to the job. So Dom Holtam is just the man to test our showgun. Not only has he driven every car under the sun roof, he's looking at this 4x4 through the eyes of a sportsman. Today he's chosen to take us to his favourite stalking ground. The rain has been torrential over the past few weeks and just getting to the woods was a test in itself. But to challenge the Shogun, we sought out a circuit taking in some water hazards and a serious incline. OK, so we're, uh, we're putting the Shogun through its off-road paces at the moment. Um, Mitsubishi has a good reputation for producing sturdy, reliable, rugged workhorses. Um, obviously, this is a, uh, a long wheelbase, five-door version, so it's not going to be quite as good over the really rough stuff. Um, but hopefully, as this film will show you, um, it's pretty useful Again, in through the mud, it's got good wading depth. Um, it's got a low ratio four wheel drive box, which means that when it gets really sticky, it locks up the center dip, it provides power to all four corners, um, which helps us get through the trickier sections. Um, and to be honest, for a normal driver, it's really easy to do some quite serious off-roading, head up some serious inclines, as demonstrated at the moment. And really, it feels like you're driving to the shops. So if out-of-town shopping really takes you off the beaten track, this is the vehicle for you. Dom tends to eat a lot of what he shoots, so this patch of land is sort of his supermarket. For these particular shopping aisles, what is he looking for in a 4x4? If you're going to have a 4x4, I think it should have a proper four-wheel drive system. I know that sounds silly, but most modern kind of hybrid SUVs, uh, they have a four-wheel drive system which is part-time. It tends to be governed only by electronics uh, and it doesn't have a low ratio box. All of these things can be important if, you know, if you're getting about in the fields. Um, Mitsubishi, with the Shogun, has a proper 
old fashioned, if you like, four wheel drive system, as well as all the modern electronics. So when you're running the car in normal usage, you can run it as a two wheel drive car, uh, which again improves uh, performance, improves ride comfort, improves fuel economy. You can shift to four wheel drive if the conditions get a bit worse whilst you're driving along. But if you come somewhere like we've come today and you want to do some proper off-roading, you can select a proper four-wheel drive low ratio gearbox, uh, which helps you get around. It locks up the differentials. It provides power to all four corners. Um, and that's what helps uh, in situations like this. Something else that Dom thinks is essential when he's considering four by fours is security. The kit we carry is expensive, but there's also a legal obligation to keep things out of sight. Uh, obviously, if you're involved in field sports, you might be travelling with uh, your gun, with ammunition, things like that, your firearm certificate. Um, you want to have a car where you can keep things out of sight. It's a legal requirement to keep ammunition out of sight. Uh, so you'd probably be looking for things like cubbies, lockable uh, storage areas, things where you can put things out of the way, put a box of bullets, you know, put, put your certificate, keep it safe, keep it dry, keep it out of uh, the way of prying eyes. The Shogun is not just a workhorse, it has an exec feel too. One of the most sensible executive benefits to have in your modern day 4x4 is the ability to breathe life back into your nether regions. Well you know what it's like, you've been out shooting or fishing all day long, you've been soaking wet, freezing cold, there's nothing better than to be able to get back into a nice cosy warm car with decent air conditioning and even better than that heated seats so you can warm your backside up and dry your clothes out. So what else do we need to tick off for a 4x4 to cut the field sports mustard? Space? Well if you're not carting around your mates you'll be carrying back your bag with the addition of a dog or two. A dog or two? There we go. Okay so we've come to uh, test the versatility of this shooting vehicle by coming here to Songbier Chocolate Labradors to see if we can get a few gun dogs in the back. Well, two great big chocolate labs certainly fill the space. Stay. There's probably room for a litter too. Stay. Now Come Dom on, is not just a shooter, he's also an angler. Here he is contemplating the question that everyone heading for a riverbank finds themselves asking, will this blooming rod fit in the car? So it's a little bit tight for room, but that's an 11 foot fishing rod straight through, no worries at all. It's a good result, and as he continues to warm his bottom, he takes to the road to see how the Shogun compares to other off-roaders on the tarmac. It's not bad, the, uh, the diesel engine is quite punchy, um, the automatic gearbox is quite smooth, uh, it rides quite nicely as well, but you sit up nice and high, you've got a great panoramic view of everything, the bonnet's designed to give um, good visibility ahead, it's got a big glass house, big windows and slender pillars, which means you can see well, and that, that's good in terms of safety and manoeuvring, overtaking and, uh, and the like. You've also got here a really, really good touchscreen uh, navigation system, um, climate control, heated seats, so for a 4x4 it's a fairly luxurious thing and it's very well specified uh, and unlike some of the premium German brands most of the stuff is thrown in as part of the uh, on the road price rather than being expensive options that you have to uh, tick the box for and add a few thousand pounds to the list price. The Field Sports Channel crew have had plenty of chances to put the Shogun to the test but we'll leave the last word to Dom. You've got leather, you've got sat nav, you've got the comfort but you've also got some serious hardware underneath you. It's very well made, it's very durable, um, which means that if you wanted one vehicle to do everything, the Shogun might be a good choice. Well, we bring you all the experts here on Field Sports Channel. And if you want to see them again and hear their words of wisdom, why not visit www.fieldsportschannel.tv and click on the big green friendly button, Your Sport, on the left. Now, I'm with another expert. Abby Burton is a London 2012 Olympic trap hopeful. She has her own shooting school here in Somerset and she's here to tell me what's wrong with my shooting. <laughs> well, where do we start? <laughs> Thanks, Abby. No, I'm joking. Okay, um, what I'm going to teach you today is shooting gun down. 
Okay, this means obviously if you're in a field, you're not going to be there with a gun in your shoulder waiting for a bird to come over or a clay, you know. Um, you do. You see people standing like that a lot, don't you? Do you actually see? Yeah. Have you seen people waiting in the field like that in a pheasant shoot? For a... Um, I haven't. No, but I have <laughs> seen a pheasant in the distance coming, and they're there ready for it straight away. Which my arms would ache by the time that it approached the time of shooting. It's a lot more relaxed, isn't it? And it's yeah. more classic. Yeah, it's 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 tradition. Um, and it, it also doesn't ache your arms so much throughout the yeah. day because guns could be quite heavy um, the further you go on. But the problem is you've got to go from there to there. Yes. And from there, obviously, back yeah. down to there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's the right. bit to learn. OK, Charlie, what we're going to do first of all is I'd like you to pop your glasses and your head protection on, OK, before we get started. I'm then going to go and grab our gun. We're going to come back and then I'm going to teach you through the procedures of shooting. Fab. All right. OK. Gun's empty and perfectly safe at the moment. Thank you. Okay, this is one that we've used last week. Very good. Um, stance and foot position. Okay, you're going to stand so that you're going to actually be breaking the target roughly around about up there. Okay. Okay, so stand so that you're nice and comfortable. Yep. Hip distance apart. Okay, you don't want to be too wide. That's it. Good. Yep. Gun's perfectly empty. We're going to practice first of all without going live yes okay so you're going to close the gun for me so it's pointing down range pop it up into your shoulder pocket just so you get nice and comfortable good i'm going to just release a target now okay so it's coming from over the back of that bank just there okay. all you're going to do is just follow it with the end of the gun just follow it up to the top and that's where you're going to pull the trigger okay okay gun now comes out of your shoulder lever across pull the front down I'll make sure I catch cartridges so that they don't come flying out. Highly trained later as well. Okay, Fantastic. that's right. There we go. Just don't chuck my fingers in it as I <laughs> go to get them, okay? <laughs> no, that's fine. Right, now what we're going to practice is actually shooting with the gun down. Okay. All right. Starting here, you're going to close the gun for me so it's pointed down range. So close it up. You're actually going to start with the gun here. Ah. So the gun's perfectly up in the air. So if that was to go off now. Yep. It's not going to harm anything or any earthworms down below. Okay. As the clay appears over the bank, you want your bead so that you can see it coming. If you have your gun too high, it becomes an obstruction. Okay. Okay. So just make sure that you can see the clay appear over the top of this barrel. Mm -hmm. Okay. As the clay comes out now, you're going to practice mounting the gun. Now this front hand pushes up to the target, just like you're pointing at it, okay? Yep. It's gonna come up into your shoulder. You're still following the target at this point. Okay. As it reaches its peak, that's your cue to pull the trigger. Bang. If you wanna, do you wanna practice that one with the live one? I, I yeah, of course yep. you can. Right. So start here with the gun. Yep. Here comes the clay. Onto the clay, move with it. Bang. Bang. Lovely. Lovely. Okay, and then lever across and unload. Well done. And you're there to catch them. Fantastic. And I'm there to catch them. Okay? Right. As you see its peak, I'd like you to just shoot the bottom right-hand corner. Okay, the, okay? The, the, the leg underneath. The legs, that's it. Right. Okay, close the gun. You're going to tell me when to shoot. I'm going to tell you when to shoot. So Ooh. start by the hip. Gun not too high. Yep. Excellent. Okay, here it comes. Lock on to the target. Move. Okay, you're still over the top. Yes. So this time you're gonna, you're gonna that's go okay <laughs> at least you're consistently somewhere yeah Good. move with it bottom right go brilliant that's it gun down <laughs> lever across and unload Is it? brilliant <laughs> gun mount was lovely you were on it you pulled to the right hand side the result being a kill because when we're, when we're um, uh, watching you shoot i mean you you have your um uh, your cheek buried right into it and yes i do yeah Everybody, everybody has different styles for different things. Because mm. um, I shoot a lot of trap, um, it's designed as a very, uh, you've got a stationary stance and you're shooting birds that are within 45 degrees. So as long as you're locked in mm -hmm. and stay, you know, nice and stable and well balanced, that is the main stance for a trap shooter. But that won't necessarily work for pheasants. Won't necessarily work for, um, I mean, sporting shooters are, are different as well. Yep. Um, they're designed that the gun should just touch the cheek mm -hmm. as and should come in line perfectly. 
Um, if you actually watch me shoot game and shoot trap, I, I have actually two very different styles. So if you have a bad pheasant day, that doesn't mean to say you're you're not going to have any no, in the Olympics. I, that's, <laughs> that's different. Okay. You see, it's great for someone like like me to be able to talk about advanced shooting with with a potential Olympic shot. Yeah. No, <laughs> I hope to be. I hope to be. And yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's one of my one of my dreams, and I think you know, hopefully it'll come true. Oh, you'll get there. Brilliant, Abby, thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Abby Burson. Glad she's on our side. Now, we're off to Scotland to try and shoot something very unusual. We're on an estate in Galloway in southwest Scotland. Nick Late is just striding onto the hill, a rifle on his back. But Nick is not stalking deer. Oh no, he's after goats. Uh, Kevin, the, the stalker, he spotted them up, up there, t t two uh, parcels of goats up on the hill and uh, we, we set off after one, there was a real big black billy and uh, basically we got to within 250 metres, uh, going for the shot but with it, the way the wind was and everything, it, I think it was pushing it a bit too much so we decided to go across to the other, other side and we saw the big grey one which I always wanted, really wanted to shoot a grey a grey goat, so... Is, is, this a, is this a decorating It must be, yeah. Reason? <laughs> no, I, just like, I, I just like the colour. You've got grey walls at home or grey carpet or something like that. I think like it that. matches what's coming in my air, to be honest with you. <laughs> Nick is a joiner by trade. His stalker, Kevin Gibson, used to be a joiner. Now, he has a better life. Well, we just basically spotted them from the forest, made our way up through the forest to the edge of the hill, then we got downwind of them and followed them up, up a gully, uh, got round about them, first group were wrong side of the wind so we didn't get a shot on them, there was actually a, a better billy in amongst them, there's uh, there are actually too many of them at the moment, we've got to call them from time to time, uh, the forest commission tend to see them as a pest, we tend to see them as an asset to the estate because we've got some pretty good heads people are prepared to pay to shoot a trophy goat. They're just living out like the deer, they're living off the heather up in the hill. Do they um, do much tree damage? They do quite a bit of tree damage but they're uh, we're sort of it's fenced to sort of three feet so they don't come onto our tree, they go onto the commission side so but they just need to put a fence up, that would solve their problem. I'm told they, they go back to Viking days. They were brought here by the Vikings you know for food and when the Vikings left they went wild but whether that's true or not I'm not so sure. Yeah we tried for the big the big black one first uh, but basically what they, they didn't sense us but obviously they knew you know something was amiss and they decided to go further and further up the hill and I wasn't all that keen about taking a shot uh, with the conditions at 250 plus metres so we decided to go down onto the lower set and, and uh, took two goats out there. We got in amongst them and we shot Shot quite a good billy, and a young billy as well. So it was quite successful, I think he was quite pleased. The first one it was, wasn't going down so obviously I reloaded and uh, I whacked it again and, and, it, and it went down. Uh, but the second one, uh, first shot kill, uh, excellent. Yeah, about 130 yards I think, something like 130, 140, so yeah, over the moon. Nick explains the tools of this job. It's a uh, Seiko 75 in 6.555. It's moderated, yeah, with a T8. And they're my home loads as well, 125 grain nozzlers. Uh, they're, it's a good bullet. It says ice, 3 to 12 56 Some of them will be gold medal heads in, in the goat rating sort of thing I would say. But that one today is average, it's about 20 inches. Um, now they're not as tricky as deer are they? They're not easy but they're... Uh, and they're not as flighty as deer? They don't run off just at the drop of a hat as soon as they see something. They'll, they'll make off quite slowly and they're sort of led by the larger belly of the group. There are two parties out on the hill today and the other one has some real luck. 
This is a silver medal head under Safari Club International's measuring system and it's in the top couple of hundred heads shot in Britain. The goat carcasses don't go to waste. Kevin's found a game dealer who will buy them for 15 quid each and he sells them on, he says, to butchers in Bradford. It's more like catch of the century than catch of the day. And next to 11-year-old Jessica Wanstall from Sittingbourne, the 193-pound catfish looks like a beached whale. Jessica caught the fish on a trip to the Ebro River in northeast Spain, arranged by her angling dad, Mark, who's also landed some serious fish in his time. I knew that fishing in Spain is a lot easier than fishing in England, and I knew there was a good chance that we'd catch a big carp but it was, it was really down to my friends because they were there catfishing and me and Jesse were there carp fishing. And, and they said all the way along, if we get a wriggler, they call them wrigglers, small catfish, um, that if they get a wriggler, Jesse can have the rod. Bodo, our Spanish guide, he picked up the rod and he, and he went, oh, it's only a tiddler, give it to Jesse. So I got the rod and I wasn't too sure about it. And I was going, oh, it doesn't feel that small. <laughs> And um, I didn't really realise how big it was. And then we got it in and it was quite a bit bigger than I thought. <laughs> it's because it's ended up to be um, like the junior world record now. <laughs> Jessica has been fishing since she was four, but experience <laughs> doesn't help you much when there's a 14 stone catfish wanting to get away from you. It soon became apparent it weren't a wriggler. <laughs> uh, it, the fish come halfway in and the fish probably thought, hang on a minute, I don't want to be swimming this way. And decided to turn and swim back out again. And that was it, Jessie was off across the mud. It took two of them to hold on to her at that point, you know, and to, to steady her. It was quite entertaining. I was starting to slide towards the water, holding onto the rod, but I didn't want to let go of the rod, so um, our Spanish guides had to stand in front of me, so I didn't go in the water. <laughs> These pictures show her during the 20 minute battle to land the impressive fish. She says her arms felt like jelly after landing it and it's increased her enthusiasm for the sport that her family loves. And they are very, very proud. Oh, my dad would just be over the moon, you know, absolutely. We just, I couldn't, you know, you couldn't describe it. Me, me dad, uh, me, Chris, Chris the one that was there in, in Spain, me, my dad and Chris, we went all over Europe fishing and, you know, bless him, he would have, uh, you know, absolutely loved it. You know. And that's the place. Jessica that's could tell her dad place. was really chuffed, even though she beat Mark's own record. No. Dad was just laughing the whole time, really, because he, he, he took me out there and he wasn't really fishing, he was sort of taking me out there to fish, and he, he was really happy that I got that one and it beat his record. <laughs> According to the International Game Fishing Association, Jessica has set a world record for a freshwater fish caught by an angler aged 16 and under. Her catfish easily outweighs the previous record, which was a 120-pound Nile perch caught at Murchison Falls in Uganda. Even with her ability to land the big fish, Jessica says she still gets more fun from catching small roach in the waters back home. Now you may have noticed that Christmas is coming up, so have we. So it's out with the crackers, on with the paper hats and off to the Sporting Shooter magazine Christmas Party. Right. And we're just trying to get that colour up, that golden colour up, then we're going to roast them. And we're going to roast them for 25 minutes and then we're going to let them relax for another 20 minutes. And it's the relaxing that's really key, yeah? It's all down to cooking time. Shooter Christmas party. We're back in a week's time with shooting politics, and in two weeks' time, we'll be enjoying all the fun of the Boxing Day meet. This has been Phil Sports Britain.
and a partridge in a pear tree. Hooray!